Thank you, Elizabeth. That was, that was beautiful. It was so powerful to hear you read those passages that I've had in my head <laughs> ever since reading the memoir the first time. Um, you know, one of the questions that you ask, and you asked it to the audience tonight, is do you see why I love him? Can you see why I miss him? Mm. And I've, I've felt as a reader ever since I first read the memoir, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely I see. And I think the, one of the triumphs of the memoir is that you make me as a person who never knew Free Gray regret that I never knew him, feel like that, that was, that's a loss. Um, I also feel like you struggle in the memoir. And, and you gave the audience a sense of that as well. Do I start here? Do I start with the birth? Uh, both of our mothers were pregnant at the mm -hmm. same time. Do I start with the horrible day on which, on which I, he died? Where do I start? Um, and I would like to ask you to go back and start at that meeting when your innards turned. Yes. <laughs> and tell everybody a little bit more about that meeting because you have to have had one of the most romantic meetings I've ever read. <laughs> well, it was, um, and I'll, I'll answer all of those wonderful pieces, mm -hmm. um, uh, and maybe first with the challenge of writing yeah. a character, you know, writing a character who would be believable and compelling to other, uh, mm -hmm. other, other people. Many, many, many people have said to me uh, how much they loved him. Mm -hmm. um, but yet, of course, the big danger, what I didn't want to do is like, you know, oh, mm -hmm. my husband, he's so cute, he's so smart, he cooks good. You know, yeah. I mean, like, you can't, yeah. th that's yeah. not interesting at all. Yeah. Um, so how to really write that. Um, and I had an interesting conversation. We were speaking about the Brooklyn Book Festival with um, mm -hmm. Mark Doty, the mm -hmm. great poet and great memoirist. And I think mm -hmm. his book, um, Heaven's Gate, about losing his partner to AIDS mm -hmm. is, is really one of the great, great, great memoirs of widowhood. Um, and so he said, well, in the writing, don't you fall in love all over again? Oh. Um, and that that's, in a, in a way, almost necessary to what it means to be able to write it so well that other people can feel it. Yeah. Um, that where to begin, and, and, and to the final part of your question, um, it, you know, it really was, the, I, I didn't read the part where I talk about, you know, having made a number of romantic missteps. Oh, no. <laughs> um, uh, but of course, you know, uh, I, I was a grown up woman and I had made a number of romantic missteps, which I think is important to say mm -hmm. because we do yeah. and because it's part of living and it is part of the way by which you know if someone is for you. Mm -hmm. um, romance starts in all sorts of different ways, but I know for me, certainly, um, the ease and immediacy um, that was not just about, you know, I mean, I would think that a guy was cute every hour, um, <laughs> but it wasn't, it wasn't that. This was something yeah. profounder, and I knew how to recognize it because I knew how to dis distinguish it comparatively from other things, and then trust it and mm -hmm. believe in it and then invest in it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and so, I, I, luckily, he was at a point in his life as well where what we both wanted to do was come together and make family. So there were not um, those contrasts, though there were logistics about living halfway across the country from each other that we simply figured out. Um, and, and you kind of got picked up in a cafe. <laughs> I kind of did. Um, um, he, I, I knew a little bit about him. Yeah. Um, he and his brothers, uh, but he was, has always been a painter, but he also was a great chef. Um, mm -hmm. And he and his brothers had a wonderful restaurant, Cafe Adulis, that was a beautiful, legendary place in New Haven for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I've loved about going on book tour, I feel like there are enough people that I could try it here. And there's one person who can't answer because I know what the, that I know someone's been here. But I go many, many, many places, and I say, "Has anyone ever been to Cafe Adulis in New Haven?" Is this the first night? No. Okay, oh, there's a hand. <laughs> is, is that Mary Nell? Yeah. Oh, see, no, you weren't allowed to. Okay, well, I know that person has been there. Um, but okay, this is the one night the trick didn't work. Um, but I go, go amazing places. Mm -hmm. Where, where, where? Yay, see. excellent. So you ate Fikre's food. And I can't tell you what that means to me and how powerful it is. You know, New Haven, Connecticut is not the center of the universe, though at mm. times it thinks it does when you're on the university's campus. Um, but this was a very special place. 
and this food was very, very unusual, and nobody knew about Eritrea, this mm -hmm. little, and, and his food wasn't just traditional food, it was kind of Fantasia food. So I say all of that to say that um, I went to New Haven from Chicago to write a play, mm -hmm. and he and his brothers had this restaurant and this cafe, and I knew who they were, and they gave us an opening night party, and I knew mm -hmm. they were just this nice family. Mm -hmm. um, but then he came to, I was in his cafe, and I was to meet a friend who didn't appear, mm -hmm. and I looked up, and there he was, and he said, and this makes my, those who love me laugh, because they say, oh, this is so you. He said, oh, can we talk about you? He said, can we talk about, I loved your play. Can uh -huh. we talk about your play? So uh -huh. I was like, moi? Yes, why, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> Do sit down, <laughs> garçon. <laughs> and so, um, but, from, but yeah. that was really that, and I gave him my Chicago address. I was going back, mm -hmm. but I had a little campus apartment for one more week, and when I came home that day, my phone was ringing. Mm. And he said, well, maybe you want to come by for coffee. And that was that. Yeah. So it was, it was a lovely and, and magical beginning. So I knew that one of the things that the book, a task it had to do was, I thought, tell what happened, tell the bad thing first. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just thought, like, I am the kind of reader who reads ahead to, to the bad thing mm. and then comes mm. back. Mm. And if it is the catalyzing event, and if the book will be described in that way, you know, I just, it, it, it's like pull off the Band-Aid, yeah. say what happened. Yeah. But then, of course, immediately, the writerly question becomes, but how do I make anybody care about these people? Mm -hmm. How do I describe their world? How do I describe them individually? How do I talk about this family? Mm -hmm. And thus, the moving around in time. Yes, yeah. And you certainly do it through the details. And, and again, everybody heard it tonight. The food, the paintings, the texture of your days together, come, it all comes through so, so clearly. One thing I wondered, I mean, Fikre was a painter. When you met him and he said, would you like to see some of my paintings? Yeah. <laughs> um, he's living in a loft. And, mm -hmm. and you describe that in detail, that he's, he's got this uh, repurposed wardrobe hanger from Macy's, and that's his closet, Macy's, yeah. that closed in New Haven. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you had earned your PhD. You were already a, a, a poet of, of some renown. Um, your family was certainly had this stature in, in Washington, D.C. Your parents were part of the political, the government world in D.C. I wondered if there was any tension when you said, I've fallen in love with this guy. He's from Eritrea, and he paints. You know, there's a difference in class there, and I, I wondered about that. Well, that's interesting. So a lot of things are interesting. Um, there actually was not a difference in class. Mm. There was a difference in history. Okay. Um, so his father was a judge. Uh, mm -hmm. He came from a long that's line right. of judges and wise people and landed people mm -hmm. in Eritrea. And then, and I didn't read a lot of this, but the, there was a, a decades-long and very, very intense uh, uh, war in Eritrea, between Eritrea and Ethiopia, mm -hmm. and everyone, including in his family, you know, he lost a brother, everyone lost someone, people were made refugees, P his father was uh, exiled because of his truthfulness on the stand, mm -hmm. right. because he wouldn't make decisions to suit the dictator Haile Mar uh, Mengistu Haile Mariam. A half a million people are dead at the end of, of this. Amnesty International is calling it one of the greatest, you know, humanitarian mm -hmm. crises. I mean, you know, so that is what interrupts this beautiful mm -hmm. uh, childhood with people of purpose and righteousness, mm -hmm. and that we had in common. Yeah but not the history. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's also interesting about um, the sort of generations of you know, work and struggle and education, educational attainment in my family is that I feel that it actually clears the way for them to have, yes, a PhD, but also a poet. Yeah. I'm the first poet, you know, I'm the first like, you know, that, that was an odd thing for me to do, mm -hmm. although so very my mother you know, to suggest that wouldn't a PhD be nice if I was also going to, you know, be a, a poet. So yeah. I think that, um, <laughs> um, why, so I think that, yeah. I think they didn't, you know, when they, they understood his heft and all that he was and came from, and he had a kind of integrity, yeah. which was what they looked for. Mm -hmm. They look for honesty and solidity and hard work and frankly, brilliance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and health. Mm -hmm. You know, we were surprised by what happened, yeah. but he was a, a, a very uh, beautifully robust person. Mm -hmm. um, I think in that very primal way, I do think that, that even in modern day life, we have this kind of primal like, who shall sire my children? Who shall sire mm -hmm. my grandchildren? Who is strong enough to take care of my daughter? I mean, I think mm -hmm. there's something that we don't even articulate that's very primal about laying eyes on someone and saying, as my mother did from the first time, she, my mother is not expressive in that way. Mm -hmm. And she said, that is my child. Mm -hmm. She looked at him and said, that is my child. She doesn't, she, I can't even express to you how yeah. much she's not like that. Yeah. So I think there's that sort of primalness um, that says this is the right thing. And again, um, uh, just to, to, to gesture, they had seen the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, knowing what that right. is, and I think I did read this out, I think a profound thing that I hope to remember with my own children is that yes, you, you know, you judge the person mm -hmm. who your child chooses, but you know your child. So is your child well or is your child crazy yeah. in this relationship? Yeah. And they'd seen me crazy and they knew I was sane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Well said. And he was like, I'm nice. He was so much nicer to them than yeah. I, he was so nice to them. <laughs> he was, uh, I remember one time he said, well, so when you're ready and you come and live with us, I was like, uh, we haven't had this conversation. <laughs> but he was, he was the yeah. kindest person on yeah. the planet. Yeah. Well, you write, you write a lot about his paintings, and which again, I think is a hard thing to do. You're talking about paintings through your language, but you're making them come alive. And in fact, there's the cover of the book is beautiful. Mm. It's, it's one of Fikre's paintings, a solitary boat in red and blue. Mm -hmm. And I love that you read out to, to the audience that quote, which has stayed with me, that he was, he was the bo boat that you thought would hold you forever. Yes. Um, yes. And here it is on the cover. But he didn't want to sell his paintings. He didn't want to promote his paintings. Yeah, Why? Yeah, you know, and that, um, I mean, that made me insane. Yeah, but um, you've done it here, by well, the way, yeah, which I and thought now, was clever. And people, you know, and, and, and he, had great, uh, he had great ego and sense of self mm -hmm. around his work. He was very serious about his work. He, as a grown-up person, after, you know, a successful restaurateur, applied to and went to the Yale Art School for mm -hmm. his master's degree. He, you know, he was, he, he was proud to do what he did, but he said that selling, that he was not a schmoozer in any way, shape, yeah. or form, and that's what the art world felt like to him. And so, you know, it, it's a, and he said, I'm supposed to be making these paintings, I'll get there. Mm. And so, you know, my God, I mean, 882 paintings and now there have been shows oh. and there will be more shows and there's interest and mm. there it's it is happening yeah and he did the one thing that only he could do you know so and he did say at some point uh, he it said will happen it will happen after after I'm dead yeah he did yeah, yeah he did yeah. And I don't think that that was a moment of sort of looking ahead, mm -hmm. but I will say that I think as someone who um, came from a culture that was war-torn, mm -hmm. who had seen so much interrupted, um, you know, one of the stories that I tell in the book that is always uh, one of the most moving stories he ever told me was um, being, I think he was 12 years old, and he uh, was educated at an Italian, in Eritrea, it was colonized by the Italians for some time, mm -hmm. so he went to an Italian Jesuit school, and one day he read, his, the teacher read out his essay in class and didn't say his name and said, Bambini, one among you shall be a great artist. Mm. One among you is a true writer and that that was the proudest moment of his life. And the next day he returned to school and it was chained shut and everyone was gone because the war had moved in such a way that they couldn't stay open safely mm -hmm. anymore. So I think that you know when that's what you come up in, mm -hmm. when that is the reality of everyone you love and everyone around you, um, you know, he lost his admired uh, brother who was, they called them freedom fighters. He himself at 16, the reason he left the country was he went to the front lines mm -hmm. to sign up and his mother went and took him back and put him out that day. Mm -hmm. And he walked with his cousin to Sudan. I mean, right. So I think that's just to say that sense of um, doing what you're supposed to be doing, of life being a full and beautiful place, but not, nothing is permanent. Yeah. Um, I think he had a really keen sense of that. And so was grateful to be able simply to 
have a family, to have these children, and to make his paintings. That really, that and to be in his garden. Yeah. He yeah. he act and to read books. You know, that was all he wanted. Well, your lives do intersect on that theme of having the ground pulled out from under you. Mm -hmm. um, you talk a lot in the memoir about how how you how you live with such a tragic loss without that recourse to organized religion, a yeah. certain faith. I mean, part of what you read for us tonight, mm -hmm. um, the doctor saying to you he could hear you mm -hmm. when, he was, when, when he had collapsed, and you say, well, we're meant to take comfort in such knowledge, if knowledge it is. Mm -hmm. You write a lot about um, visions, about mm -hmm. dreams, mm -hmm. about waking visions in which you see Ficare. You write about that hawk and that, that yep. almost that omen of, of something coming. How do you understand those, those visions, those dreams, those things that, that seem to be beyond yes. you know, the everyday, the here and now? Um, well, you know, I think, and I think one of the things that making art attunes you to is that when I make a poem, for example, I don't uh, understand everything that I've put in it. Mm -hmm. I know I have made something, if I feel good about it, that has a certain clarity mm -hmm. to it, but, you know, it's hopefully prismatic. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's not like if I wrote something for the newspaper and I wanted to be clearly understood. Mm -hmm. I want to be clear, but I want there to be facets to that clarity. Mm -hmm. um, and I am always surprised if a poem is any success. There are always things in it that I didn't know mm -hmm. that I put in it. And what, you know, we poets have a little saying where we say the poem is smarter than the poet. You know, mm -hmm. that, 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 that that's the, the, the mystery of art making. So I've, I've always found comfort, um, and this is also about generations, coming out of generations of rational black people who mm -hmm. had to be rational and had mm -hmm. to be practical, that I have the luxury of saying, I, don't, I cannot understand all of this. Yeah. And that is what life is made out of. Mm -hmm. Things that we can never understand and things we strive to understand coexisting. <laughs> So um, I think also to that end, I've always been a vivid dreamer. I've mm -hmm. always um, liked to tell my dreams. I've written dream poems that are not transcribed, but they start with the amazing images. I had an image, a dream the other night, and I realized I was tired because I hadn't been dreaming so interestingly, mm -hmm. um, that my, uh, my friend Esther, who I mentioned in the book, who's my age, um, that she had a little teeny tiny golden baby on a necklace around her, huh. a, little, a little beautiful baby and I was so jealous that she had this little baby and she said well let me take let me take her off the chain and you can hold her yeah. and she put the little baby right here and then the dream went on to something yeah. else and so I just felt like well that was a lovely fascinating weird thing mm. and I don't know where it came from and I can't explain it I could do something about it yeah. you know and sort of parse it in that way but um, what I found in writing poems that began with dream imagery is that dreams took me to the strange juxtapositions of language and perception that are what makes poetry interesting. Mm -hmm. So that is all to say that the, the mystery, the not understanding, that the rational people, the doctors, know and don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that a doctor told him he was healthy. Yeah. You know? But, and I'm not, I'm not mad at that doctor, you know? Um, and that also, the doctors who tried to save him wept. Hmm. How did they know? They don't weep every time, I don't think. Yeah. So what was that moment for them? You know, I mean, just so many moments of human power and beauty and mystery. Mm -hmm. um, that another doctor, and you know, New Haven's full of doctors, so I, you know, talked to all doctors, doctors, to yeah. understand what happened? You know, he was a smoker, as I mentioned in the, mm -hmm. in, in the book, and what, what I imagined was, oh, well, you know, smokers get cancer, check his lungs. Mm. And so, you know, I talked to all of these cardiologists, and one of them, and I said to him, I said, did you know he was a war refugee? And he said, oh, well, he said, oh, much more than the cigarettes. Yeah. You know, and he said it with such authority. Someone else, a doctor, told me a story about a priest who had the same thing happen to him on the pulpit of his church, preaching Easter Sunday service, 
and that because it was next door to the fire department, there, there was someone mm -hmm. who could immediately help him, immediately. And he was brought back and later said, you know, and we hear these stories, I saw my mother, I didn't want to come back. Yeah. It was beautiful, I was on my pulpit, it was mm -hmm. Easter, why am I back? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, and yeah. that's coming from like the doctor who's supposed to be the one who just right. has the facts, yeah. but yeah. he's telling me a magical story that also has a priest in it, yeah. and I don't have a church. Yeah. But then, yeah. you know, but Fikre's yeah. Coptic Orthodox, he comes from a totally monolithic culture. Mm -hmm. And so, though he veered from that church, we were married in the Greek Orthodox Church in New Haven, where they married like the black Eritreans, you know, because there's nowhere else for us to do it if we want to do it that way. Um, and Father Peter, you know, really became a very important person to me mm -hmm. in my not knowing what to do and seeing hundreds of his people come with a very clear idea of what you do, mm -hmm. culturally mandated, and clear cultural practices which I respected, but which were not often what I needed to do or yeah. what I thought my children needed to do. Yeah. It's so that very, it very demonstrative. Mm -hmm. It's very, there's keening, there's weeping, there's beating of the casket, there's you do it all over again in 40 days or mm -hmm. else the soul doesn't go to heaven. You know, so that passage about like, here's this monolithic culture that Fikre said no to, though he didn't, reject it, mm -hmm. but he didn't. And then here's this beautiful Greek priest who's my translator. Yeah. And who said, you know what? God can hear us wherever we are. I'll come with you and talk to the boys hmm. if you can't deal with all of that, you know, in, in the mm -hmm. aftermath. Mm -hmm. So I learned so much. I've learned so much, you know, um, about mystery and belief. Well, you say poetic logic is my logic. Yeah. And, and that, to me, it, it feels like that's what you're saying here, too. Yes. You, know, it, you don't dissect it. You don't go at it with the critic's eye. Got to trust it. Yeah, got to trust it. Yeah. 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 When we first met, you, you had written the memoir, which is kind of a private act, in, mm -hmm. a, in a way. And, and as Mark Doty said to you, it's a way to fall in love all over again. It, it, you have that person, you have those moments, those memories, and they're yours. Mm -hmm. And since then, you have been on the road. Yes, <laughs> You yes. have been at book festivals, you've been at events like this. I've, I've read about some of the responses, I've of course read the reviews. Could you have imagined, you know, the responses that you're getting from people who, who really, they feel like this is their book too in a certain way without you know without yes. destroying the, the particularity of your experience that has been amazing mm -hmm. and you know what i found because also the other part is i mean hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails yeah. um, and proper letters as well mm -hmm. and presents hmm. uh hmm. you know things that people have sent me and given me um, offerings that they feel connect them with the book in some way. Mm. Um, some of the things, one of, for me, one of the most powerful book events was in Los Angeles where I did it in conjunction with a group called Inside Out Writing that um, does, uh, makes writing groups for juveniles who are incarcerated mm. and then continues those writing groups when they're out and as part of a, a support for yeah. reintegrating them. And some of those young people um, read with me and some of those young people with the book just dog-eared and battered oh, interviewed wow. me on stage like we're being mm -hmm. interviewed. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, so the thing that was amazing is I would say a small fraction of the people who responded powerfully lost spouses yeah. or lost spouses at a relatively young age. Mm -hmm. Some people, yes, but you know, there's so much loss and love and feeling and, and the wish to connect with it out mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that humanity that I, I've been very, very privileged and also, I wouldn't quite say chosen, but I, mm. what I will say is um, I really feel like I was a vessel for something. Mm -hmm. And like with this book, I bore witness to a lot of things. 
I look back now, Simon, in that scene about, you know, and also I'm, I was so happy, I, I didn't realize before I was preparing how much of here, how much New Mexico, mm -hmm. New Mexico mm -hmm. is in this book, so I was happy to share that. But, um, you know, Simon was a little boy, and now he's a big old boy, just three years later, he's a young man now. And when I read that section, and I think what, came, what kind of knowing came through that child, I bear witness to it. Mm -hmm. He's not even that child anymore. He doesn't even, to he remembers it, but he doesn't remember mm -hmm. it. So I feel that, um, I feel very both fortunate and also what I feel proud of myself for is that I've practiced my craft over a lifetime. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been a devoted and serious artist without fail for my whole professional life. So that in the manner of, again, my family, my people who say like, get ready, stay ready, be ready, you mm -hmm. don't know what life is gonna throw you. Um, that I had craft mm -hmm. to bring to this opportunity to bear witness that, as it turns out, has been, and, and, and one thing I'm also just kind of certain of, this is the, actually only the beginning of the life of this book in the world. I mm -hmm. actually just know that mm -hmm. because of the response I'm getting. Yeah. So isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wanted to ask you a bit about your students because your love for your students comes through in this book. Oh. I mean, you, you call them, as you call your sons, my darlings. Mm -hmm. they, they seem to have enveloped you when this happened. And in fact, you went back after Fikre's sudden death, you went back the next week to teach your last class in African American art at, at Yale. Yep. Um, and you give part of that lecture. They, um, they seem to have been necessary to you in, in, in terms of holding on, but also holding you. Yes. Talk, talk a little bit about that. Well, I think that um, um, you know, one of the, uh, the real privileges and joys of being a teacher mm -hmm. for decades um, is that you know, the world is populated with former students. I was mm -hmm. thinking about that actually uh, recently, about what it means that, you know, most of, of, of my students, our students, don't become literature professors, right. don't become writers, don't become critics or artists. You mm -hmm. know, they do other sorts of things. Um, but they all carry with them what we looked at and thought about in the community that we made around those books and works of art in the classroom forever and ever and ever, and I really believe that classrooms are sacred space mm -hmm. for honoring community, for making community, for, and because I mostly teach African American literature and culture, sometimes in those community building conversations, there are difficult mm -hmm. moments. Yeah. You know, um, the J June Jordan, the poet and essayist who taught for a minute at Yale, she said, I'm teaching black literature to the descendants of slaves and the descendants of slave owners in the same mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. How do we have that conversation? You know, and this is when she was teaching there in the 1970s. So I feel really, really proud of the hard work that I've done around having difficult conversations and also sharing the joy of art, the mm -hmm. privilege of, of being in the world of art. Um, in New Haven and chairing, as I did for, for, for some years, the Department of African American Studies, building community was important. And I think that that gets back to a very fundamental principle and something that I learned from writing this book and going on the road with it. That love that starts out between two people, and I heard myself saying, I said that in that inaugural poem. Uh -huh. Love beyond filial, love yeah. beyond national, love that casts a widening pool of light. Yeah. You start with, you know, like, uh, you know, two people in a cafe. You come together, you make a world, you have children, you love each other. That, that, that is a precious resource that can't be hoarded and we both believe that it needs to radiate outward. Mm -hmm. And so too, to the community of African American studies, to the community of students present and past, who I feel belong to me and I to them. Mm -hmm. And so uh, an important lesson from my mother, they wanted to take care of me and I wanted to stay the mama. Right. So they offered to bring me food you know, just a lot of food in the book. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, and I, I was like, no, 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 no. I could do the, blah, 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 blah. and my mother said, let those children feed you. Mm -hmm. Let them feed you. And 
you know, of course, as I know, and as many of you know, and as you probably know, but I didn't know it at the time, to let people help you, to let them love you, it, you know, it is a very, very important thing to do. Um, and, 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 and it's a lesson to the young people. You know, so, I mean, of course, I had to make it bossy. You know, it's like, okay, so I need uh, a salad and a cooked vegetable, and it can't be greasy, and it has yeah. to come at 5.30, and the kids can only have dessert once a week, you know, and so, you know, I like, boss, boss, boss. Yeah. But, um, yeah. but, you know, those beautiful kids, yeah. like, they came. You know, they came, and they came proudly. And uh, it, was, it was a beautiful that's, thing. That's... And my kids saw that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're in New York. You're, you're back where you started. You were born in New York. You're mm -hmm. back. Um, I'm a New Yorker. I love the city, too. I don't live there now, but I'm hoping to get back. And I wanted to end tonight by um, giving you a small gift. I, I, know, I know you have probably read E.B. White's Here is New York, which is got to be one of the greatest. No, I okay. have not. I it's was, a real, I was, yes, this is a scoop. I mm. was looking for a copy of it today, just in case you hadn't read it, so now I will send it to you. But it's one of the best books ever written about New York. White wrote it in, I think, 1946, and he stayed for a weekend at a hotel and was thinking about his time in the 20s in New York. And it's a lovely essay that was printed as a book called Here is New York, which you will receive shortly. Okay. But on the first page of Here is New York, he says this, and I thought of you. <clears throat> the residents of Manhattan are to a large extent strangers who've pulled up stakes somewhere <clears throat> and come to town seeking sanctuary or fulfillment or some greater or lesser grail. The capacity to make such dubious gifts is a mysterious quality of New York. It can destroy an individual, or it, or it can fulfill him, depending a good deal on luck. No one should come to New York to live unless he's willing to be lucky. And I, oh, thought, of, I thought of your bravery in changing, in pulling up stakes, in making a new life in New York. And I, I just want to wish you the luck of New York, renewed joy in New York, um, and a measure of peace. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Got to get you that book. <laughs> yes, I didn't even know about it. So now off we go. Oh, they're thin. That's so nice. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you.